Perfect. Uh, welcome, welcome to Cal State Long Beach through the magic of technology. So uh, our speakers for today um, are here presenting at Alia Yakta 4. Somehow we got up to four. Uh, time flies so quickly. Uh, women and representation in ancient history themed video games, which is a speaker series co-sponsored by the David Hood Chair of Ancient History here at Cal State Long Beach um, and the Center for Critical Play. Uh, my name is Mick Larson. Uh, I do the ancient history side of things, and on the video game side of things is Dr. Uh, Dr. Sean Smith and Dr. Jeff Lawler, who run the Center for Critical Play here, uh, and do all sorts of programming, which is not necessarily ancient-themed. I've sort of forced them to do some ancient-themed stuff as time goes on. Um, so, uh, some introductions. Dr. Kate Cook is an associate lecturer at the University of St. Andrews in Scotland, I believe and is published on gendered speech in Greek tragedy, works on gender and representation, both in ancient text and in classical reception, uh, which is the umbrella field, which includes video games and other forms of digital media and other forms of media after the ancient world in which classical themes and characters and events are represented. Um, uh, in addition to co-editing the volume we're talking about today, Women in Classical Video Games, she also contributed an article to it on the game Choices, a Courtesan of Rome, which I think we all have some questions about because it seems really interesting. Uh, Dr. Jane Draycott is a lecturer in classics at the University of Glasgow, where she's published extensively on ancient medicine, including on votive objects for personal healing at ancient temples, and most recently on prosthetics as part of ancient medical practice. And in fact, we have um, someone here in the classics department, Dr. Debbie Sneed, who works on disability um, in the ancient Greek world. And that's some, uh, clearly there's some intersections there which are interesting. Um, she's also published a popular work of history called Cleopatra's Daughter about, well, uh, Cleopatra's daughter, uh, who became a Roman client queen in Mauritania and had a really interesting second life. Um, she's also edited volumes on women and historical and archeological video games. And of course, 2022 is Women in Classical uh, Video Games. Um, so uh, welcome to California, or at least welcome from the far future on the other side of the pond. Um, and how today is going to work is we're going to have sort of a, a guided conversation with Drs. Uh, Smith and Lawler kind of uh, sort of pointing our conversation in various directions and talking about the volume and these themes in general. Um, but we're also going to open it up to the floor and our many participants here on Zoom uh, for questions they will ask after about eh, half an hour, 45 minutes of conversation uh, as well. So without further, further ado, I'm going to pass it over to Dr. Dr. Smith, since he's closest to me and I can hand the mic to him uh, to get us uh, started. Awesome. Oh, wow. Um, I'm not used to these kinds of microphones. Um, so welcome um, again, um, both of you. Uh, and I guess we'll start with probably um, more of a kind of introductory question and just kind of thinking about maybe the popularity of the ancient world in pop culture and in gaming specifically. Um, I think it has uh, a set of kind of universal themes that have made it popular. And I wonder if you could talk to it um, and it's just kind of broader reception. Um, I, I guess, Kate, do you want to <laughs> take this? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, we'll need to fight over who goes first for these questions, obviously. Um, <laughs> yeah, I think, um, so I think, you know, it, it, it certainly is true that the ancient world has been really popular for reception um, and especially popular in the modern world, but I think that's not kind of exclusive either. I mean, you can trace histories of reception all the way back from the ancient world itself, where kind of Roman authors are responding to Greek authors, and then you get to the Byzantine period, and that kind of influence keeps going via Shakespeare and art and through Hollywood and then into video games as well. So there's um, kind of a persistent trend. Um, and I think in terms of universal themes, I think, you know, almost you could say that all literature has some key themes which then kind of carry on in reception. So so I'm a kind of literary person rather than um, history. And, and some of the, the big things of classical literature, like um, relationships and grief and anger and um, complicated relationships and positive relationships are things which you will see in kind of all, all literature um, being responded to. But I think also the kind of 
distance and closeness of the ancient world is something that makes it kind of carry on being popular in a way which which maybe others don't especially in kind of our societies today and by what what I mean by that is um, people think they know the ancient world because of this long history of reception that I've talked about the fact that you know it shows up in Shakespeare means that that people who know some Shakespeare will have maybe heard of Julius Caesar or Antony and Cleopatra to bring up one of Jane's people Um, and so you know they're kind of familiar enough with it that some of these things are the same but also it's at enough of a distance that it's quite safe to think with as well it can be quite flexible um, and you can kind of use it creatively um, in things like film or video games um, to explore some of these kind of big themes without it feeling like you're doing it kind of right in your backyard. You know, there are things that are different enough that um, you can, I mean, for example, just looking at, say, film, um, some of the kind of excesses of Roman um, society that we see on film um, is because Rome is felt to be safely distant enough from modern society that you can do things like have them all have incestuous sex all the time or you know get involved in kind of extreme partying or whatever and and that is not kind of as personally difficult as that might be representing it in kind of today's society in the same way so so it it forms quite a quite a good playground it seems for kind of all sorts of modern literatures um, including digital arts like tv and games to play with and i I would add to that that coming from the sort of um, historical archaeological side as i do uh if you think about europe really there is a roman footprint pretty much everywhere i mean where where kate and i uh, both are in scotland uh, we 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 have plenty of roman uh, archaeological remains um, big and small and you know that that is the case all all the way down into North Africa and in, into the East, into the Middle East as well. And so there's a an additional closeness there. You you have you have the distance of, of of in part, but you also have the closeness of oh, I can go to my local museum and I can see these things and I can touch them and, and I can I can feel like these are these are people who were here before me. And I think that sort of that allows for a certain amount of accessibility and in the same way that because you have um, ancient Greece was sort of subject to reception by Rome we also have that with with Greek mythology and and various sorts of Greek Greek art and architectural styles and things and these things end up in basic education they end up being taught in primary school education high school education Um, At university level, plenty of first year students will take introductory courses into ancient Greece, ancient Rome, even if they they have no intention of going on any further. So the people who are making the the games and and, and there's all other types of media have had this sort of this access and the people that they're making them for have had that access too. So even in places uh, far away from wherever uh, Greece and Rome ever, ever got to, so you know, China, Japan, etc., they still have this this degree of familiarity. There are plenty of universities in, in China and Japan that teach classics, um, and so people playing games in China and Japan um, are familiar with with the material that, that is at the sort of the the foundational of these games. Yeah, and I have a question which is kind of related to that, which is um, just as an introduction, what are some kind of like general major influences we can trace in reception history as it connects to video games? Because like I'm I, I'm not much of a gamer now, but when I was a teenager, like that was sort of the Wild West era of things where I'm certainly no one was going back to ancient texts themselves for inspiration or reading textbooks uh, where things like movies or just art styles were much more approachable. So like when we talk about like the major sort of reception influences, like what, what has made our sort of general picture of what games do with the ancient world? Well, I've recently been talking about this with my students, actually, because we've been looking at um, Augustus in uh, kind of modern video games. And I think, I mean, the reason I brought up Shakespeare as a result is because I think Shakespeare has, although people are not necessarily always aware of it, Shakespeare has been a huge kind of shaping influence on quite a lot of the, particularly the sort of the Roman figures, um, because Shakespeare's plays really fed into early Hollywood. And early Hollywood is then where a lot of these kind of narratives um, around what kind 
kinds of people Cleopatra are, what kind of person Augustus is. Um, you then see those narratives repeated in quite a lot of games. Um, I was surprised actually how many games, although they don't necessarily refer to Shakespeare or are kind of reproducing the same kind of ideas about character as, as Shakespeare kind of popularized. Um, and I mean, Shakespeare gets a lot of his ideas from Plutarch as well, who is also sort of a reception. Um, so I think, I mean, the kind of, the obvious source is early Hollywood and the kind of the big blockbusters have had a huge shaping influence on, on games. So things like the Cleopatra film, but also some of the kind of earlier films like, than that, like Quo Vadis and so on, the kind of um, heroic narratives set in the early empire, you could definitely see their traces in, in later games. Um, and then the kind of the more modern films of sort of our generation of, of blockbuster kind of ancient world films. So things like Gladiator, the kind of persistent obsession with gladiators in games, I think must be related to the popularity of the film Gladiator um, because there's just so many of them following on from that. Um, but some of the other kind of big epic films like Troy as well have had a kind of a, a reflection. You can see them reflected in some of the art styles of games now and kind of, again, some of the narratives around character. So I think Hollywood is a big one, but Hollywood takes a lot of its influence from earlier as well. I think there's also, if, if you if you look at the kind of games that, that deal with the ancient world, you'll generally find you have Greek mythology, game, games that deal with, with some aspect of the Greek gods, goddesses, um, and you'll have Roman army, and that, that will be um, you know, strategy games, um, city builder games, uh, that, that, so, so you kind of, they go off in these, in these two uh, different directions, and I, I suppose I would, I would include the gladiator games with the Roman army games, really, because it's sort of, you know, so, so you, you sort of just, depending on the kind of story that you want to tell, I think you, you, you will draw from sort of one or, or other of, of these uh, sorts of, of um, sets of, of ancient influences, and, and even in the games that do not strictly, they're not they're not set in the ancient world, but they sort of they have a very loose uh, classical reception. Reception. So you think about recently you know, that the Horizon games or Returnals, they use Greek mythology, you know, not in not in a very literal way, but but that that is the sort of um, the the kind of foundation of of, of their uh, culture in in those in those sort of futuristic uh, civilizations. So again, I think it comes back to what people are familiar with and and where they, where they have seen the ancient world and what kind of things they have seen the ancient world be be presented to them, what kind of ways it's presented to them. I am on now. <laughs> on on that note, in terms of sort of expectations and reception. Um, and I, I talk with this about my students too, and, and there's a certain also vision, not only who's included in the game, but a visual aspect of what to expect from a Greekness of the game or a Romanness of the game. Like we, this is what the buildings I think should look like. And so game makers kind of make them look like that, even though whatever they look like may not be a reality. There's a, a sense of, of we are there, we're doing this. Um, but that sort of expectation when you mention film and even uh, Shakespeare are the ideas of, of what stories are included in these. And you start with this sort of mythology and in these military games and, and, you know, even a quick browsing of games set in these worlds. It's like there's fighting almost always or then some gods over here and something like that. And it, it really made me think of a quote in terms of stories, because I know obviously you guys write about women in, in games is um, another scholar, Dr. Gray had said, stories are not just quaint takes, but claims about the truth of existence. And it really made me think about, you know, if we're making games based upon the sort of prior knowledge about who's been in film or, or who, who whatever, there are these men and they're in these military roles, what, where do women crop up and are they women that are agents themselves are they women who are women or are they merely just skinned as something else right um, I don't play many ancient video games but I can imagine from playing other games that sometimes developers just use them as a sort of perfunctory uh, skinning to as inclusion. So I was curious about your thoughts and, and some maybe some examples. 
Yeah, so that's something, I mean, that that kind of question of, of how much of a representation of sort of women are we getting as opposed to a sort of reskinned, uh, almost sort of typical hero figure is something that I'm particularly interested in because um, my work looks particularly at kind of agency and, and both player agency and kind of narratives of agency around NPCs and so on and, and what difference does gender make to that. Um, and I mean, you're right, quite often, particularly in very modern games, um, where we do see women, we are sometimes, especially as protagonists, we're not really seeing representations of actual stories about women, so much as a kind of a hero figure who happens to be a woman. And the example I kind of always, always come back to at the moment is the very recent Assassin's Creed Odyssey, and the kind of choice of protagonists that you get there, because you can play as Cassandra, the female protagonist, or you can play as Alexios, the male protagonist. Um, but but all of the dialogue for these characters is exactly the same and all of the quests are exactly the same and that means I mean even you get sometimes Cassandra will say something in response to an NPC about oh you know women are like this or something and you think well that line re kind of sounds very different or should sound different coming from a female protagonist to a male protagonist and the voice actor does a lot to try and make <laughs> it sound different but actually there isn't much difference and it, and it becomes even sort of less logical when you progress in the game and you've got things like Cassandra goes and competes in the Pancration, um, which should have been impossible for a woman in the age of, well, yeah, exactly. Um, and, and there are ways of getting around this. There are ways of doing something with it because what you don't want to do is say that, um, okay, well, if you play as a woman, you just can't do that quest then. And therefore you fail the game because you played as a woman, because that's going to be a really unenjoyable experience for players. But you can still engage with it. And a game that I'm currently writing a chapter on, actually, that does kind of show that you could do more in this direction than, than Ubisoft have effectively bothered to do, um, is the, again, quite recent Expeditions Rome, where I don't know if anyone's played this, but you can choose, again, to play as a male or female protagonist. Um, it's, uh, okay, I've, we've got some people saying play, they've played none. So, so Expeditions Rome is a game where you will effectively substitute yourself into the Caesar narrative. You'll start. You'll start off kind of playing with the legions and then eventually become a commander um, and you can become the kind of first emperor or empress of Rome if, if depending on your choices at the kind of crossing the Rubicon moment. Um, poor old Caesar dies very early on in the game so that's why you're now in a position to replace him. Um, he has a sad career in this version. But what's quite interesting about this is that if you choose to play as a female protagonist the game it doesn't stop you playing, but does raise that this is an issue and kind of gives you opportunities to do things slightly differently. So there's a moment, for example, where you could qualify for some extra money, but in order to qualify for it as a woman, you have to get married. Um, and this could be just a marriage of sort of political convenience. You don't have to actually pursue a romance with this character. He shows up and says, do you want to get married so you can have this money effectively? If you're a male character, that isn't an issue. You don't have to do the same thing. So they have actually thought about making sure that the player's agency i.e their ability to get these extra funds and still play the game isn't impaired but that there is some kind of flavor text around the choice of gender which is at least kind of interacting with the idea of gender um, in a way which i think is kind of slightly different and again actually interacting with the kind of historical ideas of gender as well so what would it mean to be a woman in late republican rome rather than just sort of a woman um, so, I mean, so it's rare. I will say this is, you know, this is one of the only games that has bothered to do this that I've found in a game where you can choose the gender of protagonist, but it does happen occasionally. More usually, you either can't choose the gender of the protagonist, you just play as a male, um, or if you can, it's the kind of Ubisoft model and it doesn't really make any difference. Dr. Draycott, do you have uh, anything to add? Um, I think there is something to be said for thinking about the way the way that people sort of conceptualize Greece and Rome and the differences between them because if we go all the way back to antiquity there was an ancient geographer called Strabo who when he was commenting on on sort of Greece and Rome he he was, he was commenting in favor of Rome basically saying that while Greece gave the world you know important things yeah you know um, literature philosophy etc what the Romans gave the world was, was useful stuff. And I think we can actually see that when it comes to um, you know, the, the approaches taken in games. So, so games that deal with ancient Greece use a lot of, and, and this is relevant to, to sort of women really, because 
in drawing on the Greek mythology and you know, the Iliad and the Odyssey and things like that, we see more of a of a, a use of of the divine and the mythological. So you, you have goddesses, you you have um, creatures like um, Medusa, uh, and and they they operate in a certain way. Whereas because Rome tends to be seen as as a more sort of grounded, more practical situation, you don't see the gods quite so much in Rome. What you see is this the tangible, real history and so then when it comes to games that are set in Rome you do have this issue of women like well where where are we going to use the women because if we have a game that is about you know the Roman army well there are no women there there can't ever be women there and if, if we have a game that is about gladiators we know that women gladiators did fight but they weren't quite so prevalent as, as uh, male gladiators and so what we quite often see is this the claim towards historical accuracy and the fact that we can't include women because there wouldn't have been any women there in antiquity. And that is not strictly historical, histor historically accurate. It, it, it's more in line with um, historically authentic and what people expect to see. And so this is one of the things that we, we sort of, um, we banded around a bit when we were thinking about our volume and thinking about, you know, the, the sort of the, the things we wanted to accomplish with it, because I think our sort of overriding aim was to say, there are women in ancient video games and there in actual fact should be more women in, in ancient video games because women were much more prevalent in ancient life than, than you know, popular culture, perhaps, or, or even um, a general education would have us believe because general education um, in, in school and in universities, it tends to focus on certain things and it tends to use certain sources, canonical texts and things like that. But, they point you in a very specific direction. They point you towards politics. They point you towards the military. Uh, they point you towards great men, the great men of history. And of course, there were women there, but the great men don't necessarily want to acknowledge them because it doesn't suit their purposes to do so. So if, if you have uh, people like um, Cicero, um, you know, we, we use a lot of his speeches as our sources for the late Republic. And the only time he mentions women in his speeches is, is to use them to sling mud at his, his political opponents. So you don't get a very positive view of ancient women from the kinds of things that Cicero was saying about them uh, because you know, good, good women shouldn't be mentioned at all because there should be no reason to mention them. But this is all a very contrived artificial presentation that's used uh, for one particular purpose and that's political point scoring. So yeah, in, 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 our, in our volume, all of our chapters are dealing with this issue of, well, where are the women? What are the women doing? And what does that mean, um, both for sort of for history and understanding of history, but also for readers, viewers, gamers today, and their sort of understanding of the ways that they're engaging with the ancient world? Yeah, and, and to kind of like bounce off of that, um, I think it's a, it's a really apt point that when um, sort of students or sort of the general public thinks about the Greek world and women in the Greek world, it's often seen through the lens of mythology because we have all these literary women who are goddesses who have interesting stories about them or semi-divine or fictionalized in some way. Um, I'm thinking at the top of my head about Hades, which has all these women characters and they're all divine and they all have sort of stories about them. Um, and that, of course, implies that the Romans have no mythology and they have no gods and they have no women gods, which is sort of a lie. Um, I was also thinking of, in terms of the practical fictional divide, that when we teach women's history in the ancient world, we say in a very vague way that women had more rights and they had more freedoms in Roman society, which is sort of true, but not 100% true either. Um, so when we like talk about like real history, we would talk about like the Romans because we have like Roman women that we can sort of historically identify in a different way than we can in the Greek world. I was wondering if either of you just wanted to sort of use that as uh, something you could talk about just for a little bit. Yeah. Oh, I froze for a moment there. Oh, no, no, I seem to be back. Okay. <laughs> we forgive you. Okay. Thanks. Um, yeah. I mean, I think that's really interesting because um again I mean not to kind of keep talking about it because it's it's a it's a good example but it's clearly not the only example but um again one of the kind of the 
I think almost the examples that bears out what we're saying here about the kind of Greek mythological, Roman historical divide in some of these interpretations is again, actually Assassin's Creed Odyssey. Um, and it's in the character of Aspasia. Now I'm just gonna say, I'm really sorry, but there is likely to be a massive spoiler for the end of the game coming here. So anyone who hasn't played to the end of the main quest of Odyssey may want to kind of mute me for five minutes or so, or at least until I stop talking. Um, but so Aspasia should be a really interesting kind of positive example of someone who we know was a historical figure. Okay, there are a lot of not very productive narratives around her sort of historical nature nonetheless, but she is a historical figure. She doesn't appear in many of these games. So this was a chance for them to say, you know, look, here is this real kind of practical example of women's history. But actually, Aspasia will turn out to be the main villain of the game. This is the massive spoiler. She is, it turns out, in charge of a secret behind the scenes cult um, mm -hmm. who has taken over most of the Greek world, um, is responsible for the death of poor old Pericles, um, and also is an infanticide, which is quite interesting because making her an infanticide and making her a kind of behind the scenes excessively powerful woman who is slightly more independent than she should be very dangerous to men and children i mean so i'm a greek tragedy specialist so maybe it's just me but this narrative to me says medea it says 100 percent medea and the reason i think this particularly is actually because it's very clear from the assassin's creed discovery tour that the developers of, of assassin's creed were slightly too interested in medea because she shows up in multiple discovery tours including the tour on the lives of athenian women where she doesn't belong because she's not athenian and she's not a real person with a real life so what is she doing in this supposedly informative tour well i think she's just she again you know they're they're looking at this kind of mythological figure and that's the main example that's coming to mind when people when these these developers and these writers are thinking Greek woman and then this kind of myth is even seeping into this sort of supposedly historical portrayal of a woman who it could have been really interesting to explore further but instead we've got almost in my in my view what is a kind of contamination of this sort of very well-known mythological idea of woman seeping into the historical yeah ex <laughs> exactly Medea you know could could absolutely suit a kind of real housewives of Colchis does not suit real life of Athenian women and shouldn't <laughs> suit a narrative of Aspasia. Um, so for me, that was a real wasted opportunity. That was a chance where, you know, here is a game that is, is doing something in some ways relatively rare, as we've said, because it is trying to engage with the historical stories of Greece, but instead takes all this mythological stuff to kind of inform what it ends up doing. So, so actually really kind of bears out this distinction that we've been talking about, even when it seems to be trying not to. I mean, I guess I would. I, I'll, I'll, um, I'll pile in here and, and continue to give Ubisoft a kicking, but from a slightly different direction, because that is actually something. They do something similar in um, Assassin's Creed uh, Origins, which is set in Hellenistic Egypt. And if you're going to be uh, an ancient woman in anywhere um, in the ancient Mediterranean, Egypt is probably where you want it to be, because that is the place where women did have something approaching um, a certain amount of equality with, with men. They had a certain amount of freedom and agency and were able to, to do things um, on their own. And we have a whole lot of uh, documentary evidence from a Pyrene Ostrica that, that tells us this and gives us insights into their lives. And while it's not quite the same thing as, as, as what, what Kate has, has said about um, Medea and Spasia, what they do with the character of Cleopatra is they they take the historical Cleopatra and they strip out all of the interesting historically grounded things um, that that we know about her. They, they they take out her education. They take out her her um, generalship and and um, combat experience and they take out her her maternal um side and they give it all to this fictitious character Aya and what they leave Cleopatra with is is just the in, the completely um traditional conservative stereotypical uh, sex craze drug addled drunken uh, harpy type uh behavior 
and this is this is so disappointing um, in, in, in many, many ways. I mean, you know, you, you sort of think we should really be having that portrayal of Cleopatra still in the 21st century. I mean, her, her introduction is, is the sort of apocryphal story of her saying that she'll spend the night with anyone, but they have to agree to be executed in the morning. And that's not historical at all. Um, but yeah, so so they, they, they present Cleopatra in, in this really um, um, retrograde way Whereas they've spent such a lot of time and effort recreating Hellenistic Egypt in a huge amount of actual detail based on documentary evidence, archaeological evidence, consulting with Egyptologists, etc. And they also choose a period of history about which we don't actually have a huge amount of, of Roman centric information. I mean, we have a few references in, in to, to Cleopatra specifically in, in uh, Caesar's writings about the Alexandrian civil war. Uh, like three, three references, I think, in, in, in all of his writing about this. So they could have presented Cleopatra in literally any way they wanted. They could have, with the story that they're telling, have pre presented her as a much more historically grounded, um, intelligent, political, um, astute figure. And they chose not to. They, they chose, again, Kate used the word contaminated. They, they chose to be contaminated by the sort of fable, um, fictitious version of Cleopatra that, that uh, owes, owes more to, yes, thing, things like uh, Shakespeare and, and, and more, more recent, HBO Rome really, I think, is actually a, a key influence uh, the portrayal of Cleopatra in HBO Rome, the way that Cleopatra acts, the way that she talks, the way that she dresses or she is, she is dressed, um, it, it owes a lot to um, the, the HBO Rome TV series. Yes, exactly, the, the um, Yoshito in, in, uh, in the comments, uh, that exactly, and you, you just think, why? <laughs> and they even, I mean, and this is, this is also a, a spoiler for, for um, the sort of, it's, it's part of the expanded universe of the comic book, but they, they even take away her, her death and uh, they change the story of, of, of her death. And, and it's, yes, you, you, you just have to wonder what is, why, what's the motivation here? What's the thinking behind this? But then of course you, you hear about the kind of um, sexist, racist, homophobic, transphobic working environment at Ubisoft. And then it's less surprising that they would treat a, a, a female character in this way. Yeah, and if I can just sort of jump back in on, on I mean, Cleopatra, it's not, uh, so sadly, it's not, Ubisoft is one of the kind of worst portrayals, but that that kind of um, type of Cleopatra, we actually see repeated again and again and again across games. So, I mean, even, you know, I've played, I've been recently working on mobile games and in most of those, when Cleopatra appears, she's not this kind of educated figure who could provide military experience. She is someone who in the, in the, kind of very plot light game invincible Cleopatra for example she seduces all the Roman soldiers to get past them so you can move on on a level I mean to power up she goes to beauty salons instead of I don't know the library of Alexandria or, or something like this um even in Expeditions Rome which I've just been saying you know does some quite interesting and good things with gender she appears as a character who you can sleep with if you play as a male protagonist and mostly what she does is show up and be irritating sporadically and you can choose to to dethrone her if you want as a result of her being so irritating or you can sort of work with her um so uh, yeah, Cleopatra, the kind of the mythologized Cleopatra from kind of mass media has really persisted in these, even though absolutely, Yoshida, as you say, you know, there could be so much if you want to have kind of political and, and sort of strategy focused games, actually Cleopatra could make for a really useful figure for those because we know she acted publicly, she had all this military experience, she could have been doing so many more interesting things that they've chosen not to do. Yeah, I mean, perhaps you can tell that as, as, uh, as uh, Cleopatra is probably the most um, well-known, well-documented, well-talked about ancient woman. And if, if anything, she, she is the absolute poster girl for so many issues in relation to the, the depiction 
of uh, of women in in video games set in the ancient world and, and it's, a, it's a sore spot for both Kay and myself because you know we all we have to do really is, is point and say well this <laughs> this is what's wrong with with uh, women in, in ancient video games and this is what we are trying to address in our work it um I mean, I guess not surprising so much in terms of how video games have represented a variety of non cis white men, um, because they often are created by <laughs> cis white men, because um, women here, it seems to be, they're either objectified, negated or mythologized into a non historical role, and um, which is hugely problematic. And I'm wondering, because looking at your work and, and thinking of that about inclusivity in, in a broader range, also with women, and um, is how a variety of different types of figures are included in games. I mean, more than other genres, maybe except for the American West, which is about fighting or war, shooting, um, you know, ancient video games often seem to be about war and sex, like is, uh, or something of that combination, um, is inclusivity in a broader range of stories, but inclusivity in terms of differently abled individuals. Um, I think of, th this is a, doesn't often happen in games. There are, are a few instances of this. I think of an odd version in uh, RDR2 where there's a disabled vet war veteran, but he's a war veteran, right? So there's an expectation of that. Whereas other people who may have lived in these worlds, um, how did they live, right? And and I wonder if if a lot of games in general, but uh, ancient video games specifically, be, because and again maybe I'm, I'm wrong in assuming this is their their projection of the past as dealing with war and sex, like having those other stories in there about life, how people lived, how other people who actually lived in those societies generated stories that are just removed or erased or just not acknowledged because of who develops them or who they expect to play them, right? There's that sort of feedback loop. So I was curious about how you see different types of inclusivity in these games, where it could appear, how it appears, and the historical connection to its appearance. Well, I think um, something, uh, one game that is, is very interesting in this respect is um, Hellblade, uh, Senua's Sacrifice. I don't know if, how many people have, have played that game, but, um, and, and, I, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to include it in, in our general sort of remit because it, it is sort of taking place in a, in a kind of ancient uh, um, adjacent society. It's, it's dealing with the, you know, the, the Picts and, and uh, their experiences with with the Vikings, um, but that game, the character the the that you play as the um, Senua, she she has a mental illness. She she's she's dealing with sort of um, post the post traumatic stress of of of, of losing her um, her lover, while simultaneously having sort of um, psychotic episodes, and and she hears voices and she sees things, and the way that the game has been designed is, is to specifically evoke the experience of somebody suffering from a mental illness and it was done in conjunction um, with um, the Wellcome Trust and, and uh, you know, with, with, a, with a whole lot of um, you know very very sort of sensitive research and it got it got a lot of critical acclaim it got a lot of awards it got a lot of praise from people who experience mental illness as a way of of um, of sharing this this is what my life is like this is what I experienced um and so that that was one uh, an example of a, of a game developer wanting to create an inclusive game and yet they got criticized by people with uh visual and hearing impairments because it was not inclusive to allow them to to play it and so it is, it is that interesting question of well, how, how can games be inclusive? And a lot of companies don't seem to actually care that much about making their games inclusive in any ways with the, with the argument or the, the sort of the, the, um, the justification to that being, well, we, we, we want to make money. And the, you know, this group or this demographic doesn't play these games, they, doesn't buy these games. That, so we don't need to think about how to 
um, you know, cater to them because they don't need to be catered to. And that's actually becoming increasingly less true because gamers are becoming increasingly diversified. And so there is that question then, well, how, how can we make games, the games themselves to be inclusive and then the experience of playing the games, you know, the, the technicalities of playing the games, how can they be inclusive? And I, I think that's, that's something that requires it much more thought and I suppose experimentation and um, companies that are prepared to perhaps fail, but, but fail bravely in, in their attempts to, to do this rather than just keep doing exactly the same things for exactly the same um, supposed audience. Yeah, I think, I mean, you know, I think your point about kind of stories is really interesting here and sort of what stories are being told and how that changes inclusion. Um, because it's, I mean, it's certainly true that kind of a lot of the what you almost might call mainstream ancient world games, like the kind of Assassin's Creed, like the sort of Total War or Civilization, uh, they're not interested in, or they haven't been interested in telling the kinds of stories that would um, naturally lend themselves to inclusion, let's say. I mean, you know, they're, they're, they still could be doing more for inclusion anyway, but they have also sort of limited their scope in, in the way that they design games. Um, and as Jane said, um, you know, who, who this game is aimed at is also often a big um, part of that as well. But there we are starting to see, I think, more games that are interested in telling different types of historical stories. And one of the things that that does almost as a kind of byproduct is just massively open out the types of inclusion that you see. Um, and it's not an ancient world game, but uh, nonetheless, like I voted it uh, last year, my kind of historical game of the year. So I'd like to give a quick shout out here to the game Pentiment, um, which is just fantastic for showing how as soon as you move spheres um, so as soon as you so pentiment is set um, it's a kind of medieval game it's set in um, a small town sort of in Germany but not exactly the exact location of this place is not very clear deliberately um, and it's all about the relationship between a kind of uh, local abbey and the village and because it's set in this small village and it's effectively a murder mystery you spend a lot of time going around asking what are basically normal people how they live and what they were doing. And you could do things like attend a sewing circle with the village women as a way of trying to gather clues. And it really exposes different stories. And this, you know, this includes people who are too old or infirm to work in, in some of the later years of the game, um, who are not gonna feature in a total war game because they're not part of the armies that you have in a total war game. But if you shift the story, if you kind of try and change the setting, suddenly these people's stories, who, you know, who are a real part of the kind of historical world, start kind of finding the light in a way which is quite different so I think I mean you know we we are starting to see it games like Hellblade games like Pentiment um, start to kind of tell some of these stories but it is more variety in the types of stories is, is in some ways the only way to get more of this inclusion as well as deliberate developer intention like it has it kind of has to be both almost that they have to want to do it and we have to think about what kinds of stories we're telling with these games um, I think to see more of it and uh, on that note I was wondering if you could uh, talk more about uh, the game sorry I'm on the wrong screen here the game about like the courtesan of Rome which is an intro like it's called choices isn't this like in the title itself um, which is sort of an interesting, at least I, haven't, I have no experience with the game itself, but it seems like an interesting way of telling a story, which is very true to stories that people would have experienced in the ancient world, both men and women, um, and how that represents historical agency from an unusual perspective. Well, unusual for us, but not for them. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, I thought, I mean, so I when we originally started doing this volume, I did not plan to write about Choices, um, because for those who don't know it, Choices is a one of these like endless romance novel kind of choose your own adventure games that you play on the mobile. There are tons of them. Um, interestingly, they have millions of players each. So although they're kind of not necessarily well known in the kind of mainstream gaming spheres, they are being played a lot. There are a lot of of people playing these games and uh, you know a lot of the companies that produce them produce a lot of other mobile games as well um but so choices 
is is on the mobile and also comes from a studio pixelberry studios that is interested in and has always been interested in telling stories with heart which is kind of their tagline one of the first games they did actually was set in a high school and it's a story designed to help teenagers deal with bullying in high school so the kind of overall message of the first game they ever produced was if you talk about bullying things will get better rather than if you kind of hide it so they've always had this sort of socially conscious idea behind their games i should say that actually in recent the last year or so they're starting to come under criticism for not pursuing that so much anymore from their fan base so so this kind of positive tale is starting to look potentially out of date soon um, but what that meant was when they kind of went to the ancient world this sort of socially conscious aspect was a part of their storytelling they expect to be played more by women than by men which is quite an important facet to this as well and their default kind of uh, protagonists are nearly always female I mean by a vast majority which meant that again they were kind of setting themselves up to tell a different story they were expecting to have a female protagonist so the writer Jennifer for Hepler, who was kind of in charge of this, this book where you go through this kind of particular story, um, started thinking about, well, what kind of story then in the ancient world? Because she apparently she was inspired by Latin lessons in high school. So Jane's point about kind of general education comes in here. Um, she wanted to tell something in ancient Rome. She wanted a female protagonist. She had to think about, well, what kind of story will we be telling then? Because it's not going to be a, you know, Caesar takes over the Senate story. Um, but the kind of period with Caesar is the period that people know. So instead, she she set it in this position. You are the kind of the courtesan figure. You're an enslaved woman, although actually you're kind of sort of manumitted although the game is not very clear on your legal status but you're kind of freer than you should be but have have previously been enslaved certainly as a result of Caesar's conquests um, and you are kind of attempting to get revenge effectively over the course of the game um, but putting you in this different position as a protagonist also actually, again, has a kind of interesting knock on effect in that because you are a previously um, enslaved person from Gaul, um, you are kind of exposed to almost different levels of society so one of the kind of major love interests you can have as a major love interest obviously Mark Antony or Cassius who makes a nice appearance as the kind of the assassin of Caesar um, he's he's a fan favorite but actually Mark Antony is more popular um, and but the other option is a, a former I mean, he he's a bodyguard although he will become a gladiator gladiators again over the course of the game um, but he has come from uh, Numidia he's come up uh, to Rome to kind of seek his fortune because uh, money opportunities weren't so good at home. Um, and there are kind of various other and a kind of Roman woman uh, who has been married to a lieutenant, um, a woman who's working as a kind of apothecary. You have access to all these kind of different levels of society and different characters because of the choice of protagonist, which has been made by this company who is making mobile games mostly for young women and so has made that protagonist choice. So again, it has all these kind of knock-on effects of, of the levels of inclusion um, that are connected to audience expectations and kind of developer plans and so on, which I think are really interesting and which present a kind of very different model for thinking about, again, the kind of stories we tell about the ancient world. Um, and interestingly, I mean, Choices is the example I looked at and I think is probably the best of these examples, but there's a whole load of these uh, romance kind of novel mobile games, as I've said before, and a lot of them have ancient world stories. There's some where you play as, you know, there's one where you play as the daughter of Cupid, for example, and you have to kind of bring back love to the modern world world through you sort of run a dating agency but you can kind of bring back proper love it, it's a strange sort of story but it works uh, there is a gladiator one where you are the wife of a someone running a gladiator school um, I actually really didn't like that one so I don't know how that story ends but it, you know it's an option um, and there's there's a couple of others as well that kind of particularly the sort of modern gods now in the kind of modern world has been quite popular, but nearly always with female protagonists. So these stories are all centred around sometimes modern women responding to the ancient world, sometimes ancient women responding to the ancient world, but kind of centred around women in a way that many other games aren't. So that why that's why kind of these games and particularly mobile games for me became a, a very interesting thing to look at for telling different approaches here. Um, well, at this point, I want to uh, especially invite questions from our audience, our digital audience there. Um, you know your professors, we are willing to talk forever on, on the subjects we're interested in, but we really want to hear your voices and have your chance to bounce questions um, off of our, our guests here, Kate and Jane. Um, 
So while we're waiting for that to populate in the chat, uh, I'll start with a very kind of basic question. Um, this might have already been answered to some extent, but like, do you have a favorite representation, either as a historian or as a consumer, of ancient women and their stories in these games that you've you've analyzed? Um, I would have to say no, no, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> but I will, I will sort of add a little disclaimer in that. I, I am not particularly interested in playing games set in the ancient world for sort of entertainment purposes. I, I, I game for escapism. So I, I, I play different types of games and uh, I, I, uh, I can, look at them academically um, up to a point. Uh, but yes, I, I, uh, I prefer to play the games that sort of touch on aspects of the reception. Um, so one of my favorite games is Heaven's Vault and I've written about Heaven's Vault. And that is by, that is not, that is not a, a game that is set um, in the ancient world because it's, it's a game that's set in a completely different sort of galaxy and in a completely fictitious uh, universe. But within that game, um, the, the, the character that you play as, she's an archeologist and she's investigating the ancient history of her world. And, and there, there are sort of um, influences that you, you can see in, in certain aspects of what she's doing there. Um, and there is a there is a sort of ancient language learning mechanic, and actually learning learning that language is far more fun to me than, than uh, ever ever trying to uh, to learn Latin or, or Greek personally. But then in in that in that game, you learn it by the objects that you excavate and study. You don't learn it from sort of textbooks and tests and things like that. I'm the opposite in some ways in that I play probably too many games set in the ancient world, uh, particularly now it's become a research topic where suddenly actually now I am playing too many games set in the ancient world, including many, many really terrible ones. Um, I mean, I think in many ways, in terms of gameplay, it's not the most exciting game I've ever played, but I think Choices, A Courtesan of Rhone has to come up there quite highly just because of its interest in engaging with stories about women's agency in the ancient world. I think there are very few games that are sort of that persistently interested in the question and it deserves a lot of credit for that. Um, I've mentioned already that I thought Expeditions Rome is also doing some kind of good steps along this way. Um, and I actually really enjoyed just as a consumer playing as uh, Penthesilea in Total War Tr Saga Troy um, and just decimating all the Greek and Trojan men. That was very enjoyable. I would like the opportunity to do that very often. By the end of the game, the Amazon were ruling the whole world, which is as it should be. So, so you know, I appreciate that opportunity. Although I will say that you know that had had other other issues. But as a player, that was I liked that a lot. Not yet. Nope. Um, I, I suppose on a maybe to 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 go off that in, in um, particularly Heaven's Vault and that idea of the archeology span of games and ancient games and, and what you're saying here. Um, you, when, we, when we think about ancient video games, I think we have kind of an archetype, one, that they are literally set in that world and two, they showcase something that we think is familiar with our supposed knowledge of that world. And maybe this is, questions a, a bit esoteric, but wondering and stretching the idea of what we think about investigating things that are considered to be ancient video games. Let's take Ancient Heaven's Vault, which I've never played, or, or other games that invest time in thinking about ancient history in those, in, ancient history in their games. Um, I wonder if you could speak to that and, and how some games might do that and, and, and um, their goodness or, or value or what have you. Yeah, <laughs> their goodness. Uh, 
Okay, I think Jane is nodding at me. So um, yeah, I mean, I think that's <laughs> so, <laughs> that is something we were um, thinking about actually when we started this volume because we we were quite specific in the end that we were going to go with games that were kind of set in the ancient world or in kind of ancient mythology rather than games that engage with ideas of ancient history because well partly just because of, of reasons of scope because we already had far too many abstracts I mean in a good way but we had far too many abstracts to fit into this volume as it was so if we'd included kind of a wider range of that then we would have had an impossible um, range of topics but there, that is something which you see in quite a lot of other games um, which which presents a really interesting kind of example. Um, I mean, just for just as a kind of a quite different example, uh, the Dragon Age series, for example, has got both its own kind of ancient history and ancient lore, which which you can spend time finding out about, and has a lot to do with the the relationships between different races in the current game, for example. So the kind of the history of the elves, which is sort of quite ancient history for the people in the in the games living at the time. Um, there are kind of ruined elvish cities which present quite a lot unlike sort of ru ancient ruins that we might see today and which you can kind of go around finding out about and they have kind of their own stories about the gods and as the series progresses you find out that some of this mythology is not quite right or is kind of now impacting on your own world as well um, and then they also have this society the kind of Tevinter society which clearly draws on the Romans uh, they use Latin terms for things they're called the Tevinter Imperium for example, they have a senate that runs things. Um, they're also a society of uh, magic users, so that's kind of different. Um, but but you know they're kind of both the ideas of how ancient history impact on the kind of modern world and and what types of ancient history impact on the modern world um, and specific ancient societies like the Romans are kind of clearly feeding into what is otherwise a, a supposedly complete fantasy world in a you know very different context to ours um, and that's something you you can see and do see in quite a few games whether it's kind of really direct influence um, or slightly different influence, it's that slightly more distant influence. I mean, sometimes it's just character names as well. There's a load of um, the Fire Emblem games, for example, have loads of character names from Greek myth, which seem to have really literally nothing to do with the actual characters in the game. Um, and there's, you know, there's clearly some classical reception going on there, but, but is this an interaction with, say, Greek myth? I don't know, not, I would say probably often not really. Um, it's just a kind of adoption of, again, of something which sort of looks looks familiar. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, I think there is a lot of, it's, it's not an area that I have chosen to focus on much myself, um, but there is a lot out there that, you know, could be done looking at these ideas of, of ancient history or mythology in non-ancient world games as well, that does some really interesting things. Yeah, I mean, something that, that I'm also sort of quite interested in is the, is the history behind the games themselves. And uh, this is something that, I mean, I, I when, when I was working on Heaven's Vault, I was in quite a lot of contact with um, the, the developers uh, of, of the game, and they, they gave me lots of, you know, peeks behind the curtain about how certain things came about. And um, and some of some of my sort of takes on the game as as someone coming from an archaeological background, they were like, "Oh no, we we didn't actually plan that, but that worked, you know." And, and, and so so that, that that was interesting to me this, this idea that you know you, you can you can get something from a game that seem it seems so clear to you, you know, in, in the in the knowledge of your your subject area, but the people who are making it did not deliberately set out to do that, and and um, what how 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 has that come about you know and that just got me generally interested in the history behind the development of games and and it's something that actually has has wound up being featured in quite a few tv programs and films recently um so there's um there's like hold and catch fire for example that, that looks at the sort of the, uh, a, a one games companies from the 80s through to the 90s and then just just a couple of weeks ago tetris on the on um Apple, you know, the, the, the kind of the history behind the acquisition of that game. And, and I think that's really interesting because the, the, the histories behind the games themselves, I mean, I, I, would, I would actually love to read uh, a sort of a, a detailed biography of, of Lara Croft and the Tomb Raider Ra Ra franchise, not, not, you know, the, the sort, of, sort of surface level kind of um, 
um, magazine article or whatever, but a, a really like if, if you were to take you know, Lara Croft as if she were a real person and look at the, the development of that character in that franchise, you know, all the way from the beginning and through, I, that's something that I would just be really interested to, to sort of think about because, yeah, where are these, where are these stories coming from? How much um, input do, you know, how much of it is deliberate? Uh, and I mean, if you, if you know game designers and game developers, then you know that, that, that they, they, they run the gamut from people who plan literally everything right down to the very last detail to, to people who sort of make it up as they go along and they, they see, oh, this, this just isn't, this isn't working, this isn't fun, this isn't interesting, let's change it. And, and so what are they drawing from in, in doing that process? And, and well, well can, we even, can we even pin that down? And, and so I do wonder if that's why we do find a lot of um, ancient world um, adjacent um, things in video games. It's, it's because people, people are just sort of drawing from, well, their, their imaginations, but their imaginations are, have been fed by a whole lot of pre-existing games, films, TV shows, novels, um, the, the general sort of sense of pop culture. So yes, it's, they're not actively trying to make you think of ancient Rome or ancient Greece or ancient Egypt or anything else when you do this thing, play this particular part of the game, but it's just, it's just there. They, they, you know, they didn't even know that they were doing it. That seems to um, transition to one of the questions that was in the chat. Um, Catherine, do you want to unmute yourself and ask your question yourself, or would you prefer us to uh, read it out loud? Oh, um, I, I can say it. I, I don't know much, but I've only played a, a few video games. And in those, the female characters are kind of no different from the males, except for how they appear, right? You can be a sexy, you know, um, uh, medieval woman or like a futuristic um, pilot, you know, with blue hair or something. Uh, and so is it possible that these video, these video games are ushering us into like a, an era where gender isn't so important, right? Where people can just explore other things or is this actually some sort of misogyny or just, you know, trying to erase women by making them just like men? I don't know. Um, I would say uh, sort of somewhere, I suppose, in the middle of all of that is that um, I, I think this happens out of pure thoughtlessness, frankly, in, in, in most cases, because <coughs> the, I'll, I'll, I'll give an example, I think, which I hope helps um, I'm kind of make my point, but the, um, there's a game, I played it a few years ago, I think it's called Shadow of Mordor, and, and um, it's, it's a sort of Lord of the Rings type um, game. And you, you can play as either male or female. Um, and again, like, like some of the games that, that, that Kate has mentioned, it, it makes no discernible difference whether you play as the male avatar or female avatar, but all the cutscenes are of the male avatar. So even if you're playing through the game as the female, when a cutscene hits, which it frequently does, you're the man. And that's, that to me, you know, is, is and, and, and the same with, with uh, Cassandra and Alexios in Assassin's Creed uh, Odyssey. It, it sort of says to me that this is, this is not some sort of high-minded um, post-gender world. It is simply the, the lack of consideration of anybody outside the default setting. And so because the games are made in the main by white, cis, heterosexual men, the assumption is that, well, that, that represents everything, you know, that, that is everyone can play that character and it makes no difference. And that's what you, you sort of, you, you see, we're not, we're not seeing the, the depiction of non-binary people or trans people. We are just simply seeing um, an avatar that uh, is, is the, the, the sort of the, the low hanging fruit of, of, of inclusivity. And, and so, um, because gender is actually important and, and whether you are male or female or non-binary, that affects your life, that affects your choices, that affects the ways that you do things, the things that you say, the, the way that people interact with you. And, and to, you know, until we're in a world where none of that is true, which I don't know if we'll ever get there, frankly, 
Um, I, I think, yeah, that, that, that uh, it is not, this gaming is not doing that. Gaming, gaming is, is doing quite the reverse. And it is, it is, it's not even misogyny, I don't think. It's simply the, just the, the complete inability to, to even conceive of, of, of people as being in any way different from the default. Thank you. Makes sense. We do have a couple of other questions. Um, Rob, do you want to ask unmute yourself and ask your question as well? Yeah, sorry. Um, so my question was, um, is there like a particular historical figure, female uh, historical figure that you would like to see represented in the game? Like if you had the like chance to make your own game or um, was there like a, a character that was underdeveloped? I know you had talked about uh, Cleopatra and how you wish like there was more like of the back, the full backstory and stuff. Was, is there any other characters um, as well that you would that are represented in current video games that you would like to see more develop? So it's like a two-parter. <laughs> yeah, well, since it's a two-part question, I would quite like a two-part answer. Um, and I'm gonna have one historical and one non-historical, I think. Um, so I, I mean, I have already said this, but I just to reiterate, I think the use of Aspasia in the Assassin's Creed Odyssey was such a waste. And I would really have liked to see that done better. So that is my next kind of big target. Like let's have Aspasia in a non-sexist portrayal. <laughs> um, that would be amazing. Even, even literally just not sexist Aspasia, even if she's not explored that much further. But if it wasn't kind of misogynistic, that would be great. That would be an ideal for me because she's, you know, she's a really, she is a potentially really interesting figure at the center of a lot of kind of interesting cultural and historical developments. Um, and I mean, in anything interesting could be done with that really whether or not you stuck to her sort of real history um you could explore a lot of kind of interesting issues with her um and and bring her to a lot more people's attention um which i think would be quite interesting and quite exciting um my non-historical example is i think wouldn't it be great if we had some of these kind of semi-mythological sort of action rpgs but from the point of view of an amazon so having had so much fun conquering the world as penthesilea in total war troy i'm gonna say let's have a kind of action adventure rpg where you go off you you know do some cool amazon things first and then you go off to troy or somewhere else you know as as penthesilea and that's that would be fantastic a whole kind of amazon hero story would be so interesting but obviously she's not a historical figure that's just you know this but i'm i'm a, a mythology specialist as well so i'm going to go with a mythological character that i'd like to see more of uh in that case i will also have a two-part answer and, and i will i will start with the history i would personally be happy never to see cleopatra ever again in anything <laughs> I, I you know it's it, it julius caesar too to be perfectly honest i mean they, they just have been done and done and done and there's nothing it, it ugh. Um, so, so what I would like, someone I would like to see in in a in a proper historical um, game would be um, Amenirenas of Kush, who was Cleopatra's next door neighbor, and actually, you know, defeated the Romans and kicked them out of her kingdom in the way that uh, Cleopatra was unfortunately unable to do. And it doesn't just have to be Amenirenas. There, there are all these female um, sort of queen mother um, figures uh, in Kush. And we, we have amazing archaeology from there. We, you know, we have pyramids, we have fantastic jewelry. Um, so, you know, we, 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 could, we could have a very visually striking uh, presentation of this uh, ancient civilization. And yeah, why, why don't we, frankly? Um, so so that's, that's the historical side of it. Uh, you know, just any, anybody different. There are so many interesting historical women throughout world history, not, not even just in sort of, um, ancient uh, Greek or Roman history, but you know, ancient Chinese history, etc. cetera. Um, on the mythological side of things, I played this game recently, which I just love, and it's now one of my favorite games, and it's called Witchwood. And it's a sort of, um, it's a game, um, it's for, it's, I played it on the Switch, and it's a sort of storytelling game where you, you play as a witch and you, you, uh, you have amnesia, and in order to regain your memories, you sort of have to solve a mystery. And you do that by going around your world and sort of helping people with their problems. 
and um, collecting things, casting spells, etc. And what I think would be very cool is to have something like that, but for Roman witches, because this is something that this is a side of, of the sort of mythological or ancient mythology that we don't see. We don't see um, Circe or um, Hecate uh, on the Greek side, and we don't really see um, the the Roman witches, uh, sort of fictitious witches like Canidia, Canidia and Erichtho. And we don't even see them in literature. Like the, the Roman literature tends to be very grounded in either army related stuff, retelling the stories of emperors and, and soldiers, or it's crime and it's, it's investigating like crime. And so we don't tend to see Roman sort of magical mythological stories, um, unless they're set in Britain with Druids, you know. Um, so I would actually like to see a, a, a Roman um, witchy witchcraft mythological game because, you know, for, for the Romans, uh, witches are sort of, uh, you know, um, strange women and with, with uh, all sorts of uh, ideas that, and uh, aims that they are trying to achieve. And I think that would make a great game. I think those answers kind of answered Alvin's question, but Alvin, I'm going to let you ask it anyway, um, if you want to. Um, you're welcome to unmute yourself and uh, ask away. Maybe. He is, he's turning his mic on, um, or his mice, um, as it says in the chat. <laughs> Um, We've got a question above that as well. Which is we there could... one above that? I missed it. Go yeah, ahead. Jonathan. Oh, Jonathan. Yeah, about Fire Emblem. Jonathan, if you're ready, why don't you unmute and if you're still here. Uh, sure thing. Uh, hello? Yep. Okay, perfect. Hello, everyone. Uh, yes, I had a question about like maybe a historical, not what is it? Um, like uh, alternate history. That's the term for it. For games, like I, I referenced one that it's very anime. It's not historical at all. They just use the character of Napoleon Bonaparte's sister as a general. And But uh, it brought to an interesting question. Should there be a focus on more historical women like Boudicca, for instance, and things like that? Maybe a game around that? Or should there be things like that just better done than, than the, the anime version I had? But maybe it's still, you know, a character that's in history that didn't do, you know, Boudicca eventually um, got defeated, but in the alternate history game, she kicks out the Romans, or should there be more true, um, you know, uh, events in the games? I think both. Um, and I should say, I mean, this is my answer to almost everything when I've asked about, you know, what, what would you like to see in games? The answer is everything. Um, but I think I think there's a lot of potential. So one of the things that kind of in historical game studies we talk about quite a lot is the potential for games to explore counterfactual history. Um, and, you know, you can learn from that as well as it being just sort of interesting and fun. You can learn quite a lot from trying the counterfactual. You know, what happens if um, Caesar dies at the age of 20? and you know what happens to the the Roman Republic then perhaps nothing perhaps the same things um what happens in in a certain battle if you decide not to kill all your elephants going over the Alps what happens if Hannibal reaches Rome and has got loads and loads of elephants you know there are all these kind of interesting counterfactuals that games allow you to explore and I think the positions and lives of women could be one of those um and alternate history can invite you then to bring up other stories which even though you're not necessarily talking about a real Real historical figure can still bring in other actual historical issues. So if we did play a, you know, a Boudicca triumphant game, for example, I imagine there may well be other interesting women's stories that come about as a result of that, um, at, you know, by just by shifting the focus. So I think there's a lot of potential for sort of alternate history or counterfactual history in these games um, that could be explored. But I wouldn't, I probably wouldn't want that to be the only way that we're ever seeing women, because that kind of presents a narrative that the only way you get historical women is if you change history whereas that's obviously not true there are real historical women who need to be better represented as well and, and kind of could be better represented so um both for me please thank you yeah agreed oh, to all of that 
I think we are running up against time. So I'm going to give Alvin the last word here or the last question. Um, we'll give our speakers the last word. You ready, Alvin? Mm -hmm. Or should I just ask for you? I'm set. All right. Look at that. Um, yeah. So like basically my question is like, how like how, what are the ways that you can integrate like gender and like sexual like you know representation in games considering that like from my experience with playing games like female representation tends to be just kind of like slapped in um and also like especially with like military games especially in war games right um um a lot of women or like especially or like queer representation is just kind of placed there without actually understanding the misogyny and the discrimination they face, and it just makes it seem like, hey, look, you know, th there's a lot of those characters that are just there uh, without kind of like fully understanding the actual issues going on in those in those time frames, right? Yeah, I mean, it, it's a very interesting question to sort of, I mean, my, my sort of, I, ha I have a question in response to this, and it's this kind of thing that I, I wonder quite frequently whenever I consume any any kind of media and it's do the people involved in this have women in their lives you know um lgbtqi people in their lives because i wouldn't have thought so based based on the way that they have presented you know this uh, you know this woman in a stereotypical way or this this gay person in a stereotypical way or whatever and it's it's uh, you know, uh, if, if, if any of you have played The Last of Us 2, for example, and that game is chock full of really great and interesting representation. Um, you know, Ellie and, and, uh, and Dina, you know, they, they have, a, have, have their relationship and there is um, a trans character played by an actual um, trans actor. So they're, they're, they're really kind of doing, doing a lot for and 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 that and the the trans character Lev, um, his story is his, his and who he who he is and his journey is a key part of the story of the game and the and Abby's character journey and everything else. So they do all of that good stuff, and then they just have a really hideous gratuitous sex scene between Abby and Owen, which I sort of just think, well, why is that? Why is that there? Why did you choose to do that that way? And I think I would hold games to the same standard as any other type of media. And I would think, well, is this furthering the story? Um, is, are, you, are you doing everything you possibly can to, pre to present a sort of well-rounded character and, and story? And because almost like re representation that's tokenism is, is, is bad, you know, it, it's, it, it, is, it is bad. It's bad to watch and it's, it's bad to sort of, um, Sort of see and 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 you know if you're looking at that and you're seeing a, a sort of funhouse mirror version of yourself and your experience and that's just insulting. So I I guess I would I would sort of I would say that gender and, and sexual representation and everything to do with human sexuality um, could be integrated into video games if it was done with with care and with respect and with a real effort to um well just just sort of simultaneously i suppose have it service the plot but at the same time also not just be there to service the plot but to sort of just be be there because you know in, in life it's there so so yes i mean it when when you when you look at when you when you hear about certain companies and the certain issues they have um you, you can see why those are perhaps obstacles to getting that more nuanced uh, representation in the games, but you know it's 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 funny because the stereotype of, of the you know the, the game developer person is that someone who you know doesn't have a life and and doesn't have any sort of sexual partners of any kind and well that's not true. <laughs> so you think that they could bring their real life experiences into into their work? Yeah, I agree. I mean, I think what you just said there, Alvin, about kind of, um, you know, I agree that far too often things like gender or sexuality is just kind of shoved in and it's like, look, here's a woman. OK, that's it. We're done now. And that's one of the major problems, I think, you know, going back to Catherine's question with this idea of kind of just a what is effectively a male character reskinned to look female. But 
nothing at that you know that for me isn't useful representation um in any context whether it's kind of historical or sort of modern fantasy that 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 isn't representation it's just kind of looking different um so for me the the kind of the big thing is engagement i think you know real um thinking about and you know some of the things Jane's just said about sort of care and respect and so on but if you're engaging with the issues if you're actually having characters talk about things like well how does this change you know your agency or um how does it change are you having developers think well how might it change this conversation if one of the people involved is a woman or is a person of color or you know is if in, in the, if we're in the ancient world is an enslaved person or or any of these you know um is or isn't disabled what kind of differences is that going to make um as long as you're kind of thinking about that and trying to do something with it rather than just sort of pretending it doesn't exist then I think that would be a really positive step towards better representation I don't think that means everything would be suddenly perfect and I think there are games that try and do this engagement and still get stuff wrong but at least they're trying which demonstrates that they are actually thinking about some of these questions which as as Jane has said and I totally agree with a lot of the times the sort of the bad or just sort of non-representation that we get really looks like this is just something that no one's even thought about so efforts to engage would at least start to kind of change that and I think would be a, a good step forward. Thank, thank you. And I was struck by like this, this part of the portion of the conversation, how similar to an extent like doing history is a similar problem to this process of like telling stories through games because what we're trying to do is like represent reality with very limited tools in a very limited space, but in a way which tries to feel authentic um, and there are so many problems in doing so. And like art is obviously a representation of reality as well. And like good art, now I'm like hypothesizing about art theory, which is not a good thing to do because I am neither Plato nor Aristotle, um, is stuff which like hides its unreality in w well enough that like your brain sees it as something which is true. Um, but of course the critic will always be there to pick apart the unreality of it. And it's like, like you can always find imperfections in any kind of representation and in any kind of uh, attempt to like present a real perspective. Anyway, we could go off into the weeds on that, nor do we have time to do that, nor am I the right person to. So I really just want to say thank you so much to Kate and Jane for coming here and gracing us with your time and your knowledge and your really interesting discussions of all of these questions. And uh, there's only a few of us here in person, but I'd like to extend a hand of, of uh, applause and congratulations for you and your work. Um, buy their book. It's available wherever books are sold to academics <laughs> at a not at all inflated price, uh, but it's available through libraries and other means as well. Um, so so thank you so much for visiting us and giving us some time from your evening. And uh, I wish you, wish you the best. And uh, thank you so much for participating. Thanks. Can I just say, if anyone is looking to buy the book, but is on a student budget, there is a paperback coming back. I, I mean, we've only just learned this basically from Amazon, actually. But apparently there is a paperback coming out um, at the start of next year. So if you'd like to wait for the price to drop, please do. Um, but also it's currently reduced on Bloomsbury's own site. So if anyone is feeling like they really urgently need to buy it, you can get it slightly cheaper than normal right now. <laughs> and if you're interested in history and archaeology and games more broadly, there is my other book by De Gruyter that uh, is available, um, I think, also through Amazon, also through university libraries and everything else. So that, that picks up on some of the stuff that we, we've talked about, including um, Heaven's Vault and uh, other, other games that feature some aspect of history or archaeology that is not um, ancient Greece and Rome. Yeah, I had meant to ask about that, but we just there was no time. There were so many interesting things to talk about. So thank you so much and uh, good night. Thank you. Thanks for coming, everyone, and for your questions.